means long-term debt plus a risk premium. Another way that you can think about this is that if you look at governments, you've got a thing called the default swap on a stock. The credit default swap is that um, to take on some African risk, you need to file and that's how much you have to add to the, the government, the, U, the, the U.S. government's crop to get to a South African equivalent. Okay? Sorry? Yeah, that sounds about right. And that's, that's for South Africa, that's for Brazil, that's for Russia, that's for Turkey, that's for a variety of kind of countries. Okay, so it's all we, you know, no risk for you. And now Germany and I always got a negative uh, interest rates. Okay, but that's all right. And this was frank. But the main thing is that you, you start off with the US government and then you add the CD spread on the emerging market connections. So that's very similar to this type of bond yield plus. So I think that's it, but again, that's for me, not for, not for uh, companies. Okay. It's for publicly listed companies. Now, this is. Uh, if you want to calculate, if you want to calculate the beta for <laughs> what you can do, to, um, you have to choose a specific index. Now remember, this is once again an American exam, so the index that is used either the uh, NYC Composite, the Stock Exchange Composite, or the S&P 500. Uh, but what you have to do is you have to take a specific index, you have to take it over a specific time, and then you regress your your specific company over the well. We do the, the regression of that. So five years to explain on what you want to do. Okay, so um, this is where we come to the new and old companies. So we'll do it. So there's a lot of changes, and five years to more established of market or company. Then this beta adjustment, Bloomberg does exactly this. All that is if you get a beta drift, so what it says is, you can do an object, you can, you can, <laughs> what it does, takes the actual beta, times it by two thirds, and then just add a third. <laughs> and then obviously, that's the attack. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, somebody asked me before, why do they do that? I don't know. That's just something that the guys do, because it naturally goes to one page. Okay, uh, so if you need to do an adjusted beta, you know how to do that. You take the actual beta times two over th two thirds and you add a third. Okay, now the important thing about unlevering and relevering beta, and this is where we're going to get to now. So the beta is for thinly traded stocks. If it's a thinly traded stock, then that you won't have the right, you won't have the correct. So hard here because maybe it trades like once a week. Right, so you you would use a public equivalent for a similar sector or something like that, and then use that company's beta. You unlever it. The preferred way to do it is actually to take a sector, but you let's say you take a sector beta. You unlever the sector beta that's listed. You take your company and you <laughs> relevel on your company's, uh, you relevel the beta on your company's uh, capital structure, and then you get the beta for that unlevered company. Okay, so have you guys done this in corporate finance level? Yeah. So you guys did it. Okay. Let's go through it quickly. It's not that. Okay. So, so if it's a Food retailer, it's a small food retailer that's not, or a big food retailer that's family business not listed. Then you take, let's call it uh, Shopper. Okay, you take Shopper. You estimate the beta. So in other words, what you do, take the top 40 or the JC all share, you're going to do a regression analysis on ShopRite, you get the beta. Once you get the beta for Shopper, you the Shopper down here. But then what you do, you're going to because obviously they've got dead. And why you on the that's why 
one divided by the square of this formula one. So when someone uses the equity of the product, that's five point eight. Okay. And then step four, so what part of being done is you have unlevered the bait. It's time that you make. In other words, that's basically if there's no debt. But the bait is if there's no debt on the bait. Capital structure is 100% equity fund. Then, after you've done that, you take that. Of your company. So, remember, this is book value. And that will give you. Then we round off price. I think we actually got an example. No, we don't. Okay. So we start so you guys will do the things to the eleven guys. Okay, I'm pretty sure you're yeah. gonna do this fast one. So I don't want to steal Paul's thunder. So you can. Uh, the last time when I and I, when I lectured this, the guys went through corporate finance, and then we just said, okay, you guys know this is God. Okay, so. I got to you. To the guys. Oh, okay. So describe the strengths, the weaknesses of methods used to estimate the required rate of return. First of all, capital model is not simple to use. Is one factor, but once again, low explanatory power. That does not preclude every single investment bank in the world to do a lot of work on this. Thing. Okay, if you want the, the betas of a variety of companies on the day on the S and P, uh, one particularly guys from reading uh, New York Stern called uh, Ashwin Dromedarin. Dromedarin, yeah. Um, he, uh, he's got a website, you can, there's a lot of information there, you go, go have a ball, okay, there's a lot of data on there for every single sector, utilities, water utilities, electricity utilities, everything there for you, you give it and unlimited, so you don't have to do it yourself, okay, so that's the capital model. Multi-factor model, high explanatory power, but way more complex and expensive as there are many factors, and then lastly, build-up method, Extremely simple to use. Uh, it can be applied to closely yeah, held companies, but lastly, they use it to sort of value. It's not although to be fair, so does the cap and Okay, but once again, it's it's a bit simplistic to use. Then the you haven't covered yet. Then the country spread model. This is actually also called the government. Now we're in jail, by the way. Still, they actually they actually did this. For internationally required rate of return, because we can use the country split model. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. With a bit of connection across all three levels of CFA, model, and it's going to come back. Take it to the for a developed market. So uh, I'm just trying to give you just a bit that you. So that's me basically. Um, it is. It's the, the poor cousin. And so we'll okay, the country premium can be as well as looking at this. So that is comfortable. Okay. We talked about this. If you use a 10 year in the States and you use the R, 1.6 is not, it's not shorter than 10 years. Though. The relation is what? Like, anyway, let's say the 1 at 6. Let's make it a 1 at 6. Um, you use the R1 at 6 and you use the, um, the 10 year uh, US. Remember the ones in Rand and the other ones in dollars. So you have to do it for that as well. Okay. So that's not the right way to do it. It's like the ECD is pretty slight. Okay, any questions? Like Using through this stuff. Okay. okay. Um, well, that it probably doesn't feel for you, actually. So it's just like that's the difference. Yeah. Okay, the weighted average cost of capital. Um, I'm pretty sure you're going to do this in corporate finance, but it is extremely important for Thursday's lectures. So let's go through this statistically. So the cost of capital before and after tax. Um, and it can be calculated on the basis of weighting each type of capital that you get, or that you, you get from investors. Okay, so, the weighted average cost of an individual fund, and then it's going to be considered to be adequate, and the way that we're going to do this, we're going to split it into... <laughs> ...any tax implications for when you're paying dividends. It doesn't work like that. There's no tax benefit from paying the rate. Okay. So, the of all taxes is not for your account, it's for the investor's account. That's so important. Okay. 
So no deductions for any type, no adjustments for market value of debt, if anything. Market value of, sorry, for this word, if it's market value of debt, you have to look at it. If you can use a calculator, one month, the the Why do you do that? Because of the tax. Ultraman has these very nice and get over a cast. Pull these calculations out because that's it. And then it's again a dividend, so there's no tax benefit for you as the company. Okay, so this tax is this quickly. You know the funny thing if you start to use the Texas market value of market value of debt divided by the sum of all the capital market value of debt plus the market Okay. Times the cost of debt times one minus. So important here is that you're probably going to use the tax rate of where the company is listed. Okay. And obviously there might be a blended tax rate because there's a lot of operations in Turkey, Brazil, wherever. But you're going to use the tax. You're going to use the tax rate for the country that they're in. Or what you might be using, you're probably going to use the tax rate of the Got a bit of a list of the cost 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 the cost of the cost of the cost the cost so I think that's the required rate. You might say, okay, just uh, give you. And then also, discount rate. If it's preference share, it's going to be the market value of preference share divided so by the discount rate. Remember the discount rate times the, rate the yield problem of the preference share. So I'll tell you what. We're not bad. We need to have that uh, preference share. Okay. Now, so everybody understand what? Okay. Getting some. Okay. Let's go through an example quickly. Okay, preference share is bonds and equity. Here's the market values that have already given you the sum. The quite return before taxation, and they took the tax rate. Important, the only place that we're going to tax rate is bonds. Only that one. So it's going to be the weighting. Okay. Okay. Got to wait. Multiply. You've got to multiply this with 1 minus 30% times 10% because obviously debt is always past the tax. So 1 minus the tax. And then you take all. And in the exam, they're probably going to ask you to work out that equity. And you're going to use the cap and model to do that. Okay, here they've done the calculation, and then after that you just get to you get some of that and you get 11.93. We've kind of mentioned already, but if you if you look at the cash flow, weighted average cost of capital. Remember, the firm is financed by all the all the different shares and debt providers. Okay. Whereas, if you think about cash flows to the equity holders, the equity holders will only pay the preference share, the preference share providers. So that's why, and that's why you use the cost of equity. And then, obviously, the cash risk of the debt all this you use the cost of debt. Because that's obviously lower risk as well. So to get back to my pizza example, which I didn't <laughs> incorporate efficiently, <laughs> so obviously, that is <laughs> cost of cash. Now, when am I going to give it back to you? Okay. Money has time okay. value, doesn't it? Okay. And that's it. Any questions? How much would you pay? This one is quite quick. Let's take a five minutes if you want. So let's uh, I'll start at, at on that clock at eight fifty.
the next one is quite quick, so, uh, so it won't be too quick. So to this pinch it. Then please come ask me if I have any questions. I'm here to assist. Okay, I think you're quick. Has anybody got any good investment ideas? <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, well, that's, that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. I can know, I would as well. So this card rates is. Unfortunately, I don't know. That's why, because if I'm borrowing a 10 and I'm earning a 10, well, there's not much room for error, is it? We make it a little bit higher, don't we? Okay. Good. So I just get with this but I come with Jake again. I mean, it's running at like a, what's it, like a seven and a half feet. People just don't, they, oh, but they also said the GDP curve is pretty yeah, If you need the GDP, that's what the curve is about. It needs, it needs manufacturing in mind. So, yeah. Technically, in Victor, it's also seen yeah. like that, but then you've got, oh. you've got Chris Teresa exposure, unfortunately, because he's the, he's the sort of, not that it's a ball. Listen, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, his his investments have not done well over the past. So. No. That stuff is cheap. Oh, valuations is rock bottom. So Metrofile, oh, so Clover, Clover delisted. Metrofile is in process of delisting. Rolfs is delisting now. There's another one I'm to get. Um, Astoria, but Astoria was bought over by Pitfall Instinct. Um, 
We actually played the clo we actually played a lot of them. We played Astoria, we played uh, Clover quite well. We were quite lucky with that one. Uh, Metrofile we actually just sold out. Um, Ralph's we also held, we sold out like very recently. But it's just like, so, but Ralph's is going to be gone in the week and a half time um, to be delisted. And there's, but Metrofile is not a free day. But it's, I, mean, I don't know when the time to, Fine year is not approved yet. I mean, that's still a... Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to play Zedra, but I don't know if that's going to be a difficult one to play, because what is now? It's like 4 and 60, 4 and 65, 4 and 70. And I've worked out what the NAV is and if they play a divvy. So there's still a bit of upside there, but there's deal risk there as well. And I don't think people are taking into account it. If you look at the Pioneer price, people think that thing's going to go through. But if you look at the, the Zeta price, it's a different story. I don't know, it's like it, the, the shares are telling two different stories. So we own, I own Lipsoft PA and I own it in your funds and I own it for my parents as well. I, mean, I think that thing is good. <laughs> Oh, well, there's people that there's people that are still selling like crazy. I mean, the things. No such problem with your tickets. I can promise you. Look at the Woolies numbers. The Woolies, the Woolies food number was like yeah, eight. Yes. I don't know, man. Something wrong with it. I can't. I can't think that it will be a bad trading update. They should come to the market soon. Yeah, if you've left update, something, so. perhaps. Let's see. Anyway. Wow. Alright, so we push on for the last one. This is a this is gonna be a quick one, so it won't be okay. 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 Well, the for the evening. Okay, so we've kind of already gone through top down and bottom up analysis and we talked about the system and stuff. So um ten percent so one input in the in the valuation models can be viewed from other things, either you're gonna do it from a Economic, macroeconomic perspective, so that's top down. And as I mentioned, the cement industry is a very good example of that. Um, another one would be uh, a bottom up approach, so you use the company's own metrics. So if you think about a retail store, if you think about clicks, quite quickly, but your answer is going to be quite right. Based on your uh, your store expansion and, and you're going to split it up into two, you're going to go from a like for like growth okay. as well as from a store from a store footprint or from a square meterage uh, growth. And then the you're going to use basically both. That's essentially all and you're going to test both from that. So Price and then okay. So the bottom up, you it again, and then hybrid approach is you're going to take both elements and then to essentially triangulate from both sides. You can do it from a top down and from a bottom up perspective. So you're going to see how, how much demand there's going to be from a, from a country perspective, the installed capacity of the, of the um, market share of the specific company as well as how much they can potentially ask for the bag of The GDP multiplier effect is of growth given the GDP. So if there's a multiplier effect in that is going to be quite high. Then market growth and market share. Now important here is there's two types of things. I look at the total risk for market and prime market. It's a market um, of whatever let's call it now. Let, let's let's go to something to Let's go to palladium. So palladium is obviously used mostly in catalytic converters and there's a certain amount of um, that's used in the amount of cars that's produced. So 
The USA produces you know, like 18 million, 17 million cars a year. The whole world, you know, like 100 million roughly. So, I'm just using that as a number. So from that perspective, the diesel cars, I mean, the petrol cars, you can infer how much palladium and how much rhodium in a catalytic converter is anything between 0.2 to 0.4 grams, and from that you can infer how much demand is going to be. It's rhodium, rhodium, I think it's 4 grams or something, rhodium and rhodium. Flame is a lot higher, like four, four, six. Days. Now, from that perspective, you can also and what the supply and demand dynamics. Are. Now, first of all, you've got market growth. So, in this example, as you about emissions and so on, your load is 0.2 to 0.4 grams in the entire world. Okay, so China's catching up in this case. a lot of demand. Okay, so your whole market is growing, your demand's growing. That's your first factor. Second thing that the inspector can count is your market share. If you're Sabania or you're Northern or you're one of these these uh, companies, as part of your PGM mix, you have rhodium and you have palladium in your platinum mines. Okay, so <laughs> how much your market share is, and if they are mining more efficiently, then you can make it a So there's two things here that you need to take into account. You need to take into account how much the market's growing, that's what it is, how much the market is growing. It's costing you to expensive to do that, but that's very really nice. If the market's growing, as well as your market share. Now, what if the market can grow, if it's only price, let's say the ounces that's mined stay the same, but because of the itself grows as well. So the market growth is split into two factors, or two components. It's split into volume growth and it's split into price growth. So if one of those grows and the other one grows, right. how much the market is the right. right. That's that. You have the value of the market. I mean, more so it can either be volume or it can be price or it can be price. So as a, as a side of tobacco, tobacco market is growing, but the volumes are declining like crazy. So what they do is they increase the price of this. And that feel it because the sin taxes is so high. So if you're, I don't even know what a pack of cigarettes is, like 40 bucks. But 10 Rand goes to uh, BTI or, or Philip Morris, and 50 Rand probably goes to the government. And when the government pushes through a 2 Rand syntax uh, every, every year to budget, then all that they do is they take a little bit more than, than the, the, the percentage that, that the, the government takes, the, the manufacturers take a little bit more. So then they push through a 10% but it's then there it's one rand just goes to one rand ten, but you don't feel it because it's ten oh, it's a uh, ten rand to eleven rand, but you you're thinking oh the government's taking more money, but that's how they actually get the stuff. To okay, so that's just an example of of the market still growing although the volume's going down. Okay, the value is very economic scales are present in the industry by analyzing operating margins and sales levels. So basically all that you're doing here is you're checking here whether as they increase their sales, but the operating margin as you get more the main thing that you can do and how you would do that, you would say, okay, so <laughs> cost of sales is then obviously a percentage of that, and then depending on what <laughs> is a proxy, 50%, then obviously it'll look up to quite a coincidence.
But the more important thing... You know, maybe your GP margin is going to be stable at 26%. And because your FTNA and stuff doesn't start fixed, um, maybe you've got one head office and you don't need to employ another 15 accountants that can go. And Marat, how do you work out the penny or price of each bit? And that's what you're trying to, to figure out. Because this is this is, this is coming down to forecast in your debt. What you're trying to determine is how much of the if you're growing the company, if you're growing your sales, and obviously your GP might increase a little bit depending on efficiencies. But general and admin. How much of that is variable and how much of that is fixed? And if a big portion of that is fixed, then this thing is fairly scalable. Whereas on the other side, if it's all variables, then obviously it might not be as uh, scalable as you thought it would be. So the ultimate scalable, what do you guys think is the ultimate scalable business? Download click that. You've already spent the money, but it's perfect. It's the software's one or network effects, which is the So you've got Facebook, that's I mean, that thing's there. The additional user doesn't cost you any money, and it just keeps on going and going and going. Right, sis. So it depends on it depends on what the uh, yeah, so you think about how much. So obviously you've got ads. Like, you've got that, like Instagram and these net, these massive networks. Like WhatsApp is a perfect example of that. Like the additional, your friends are on there. It's like a proper mode. Nobody's going to join. So obviously it's all between each other. But that network or the software is a perfect example. Okay. So on cost of goods sold, so when you're modeling this, because we're going to the forecasting side now, right. so, so you've got the sales that you're going to forecast <laughs> per unit or sales per square meter or anything like that. Now the cost of goods sold is obviously depending on what the underlying business is, but what will tend to happen is, if you think about it, let's look at Bourbon properties. Bourbon properties are really easy to come into model, it's not that difficult to, to understand because they build a house and they sell. So, if you look at the uh, cost of goods sold, obviously these guys have got a certain try and get, and they have a certain mark of the So if you look at the historic uh, cost of goods sold as percentage, and obviously cost of goods sold and GP margin are related because, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, but the main thing that you take into account with regards to that is, if the historic cost of goods sold margin was 75%, and that it's been 75%, to raising between 73 and 77 percent for the past seven years, it obviously makes it going to be pretty much within that range. Okay, so that's how you would, that's why you would use the historic estimate. What? what you might tend to do is depending on where all the different developments, maybe the GP margin gets up a bit, so the cost of goods sold, as it goes down. But there's a variety of things you'll take into account, but the main thing is you take the story as a value. Okay. And that's how you would forecast it. Um, okay, so a good way of assessing a reasonable list of the ratios is to compare them with industry ratios. And depending on how they compare with other stuff, that's one way to, uh, to take into to, to look at that. Um, and it's not the mind for the components of the French cross that get sold when it's more than the full cost of cost. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, the main thing here is that you want to make sure that you understand what's variable and what's going on. So if you have an airline industry, obviously the cost is going to be quite big. But that's, yeah, I mean, you would, once you've done the industry analysis, that will come up quite quite quickly when you do, when you start comparing that. Okay. HCNA. Now, HCNA. There's a large respect. As I said, if you've got your uh, five accounting, sales, <laughs> not going to. Okay, but make it Get that 10%, you're probably going to have to get another salesperson. So then we're going to add on certain. That will tend to. 
styles will tend to vary with styles. But obviously you have to have to look at how these things move. And usually what I say there could be more. With the first one is the default premium. What's the default premium? Yeah. Why would I add more to the right? Because I think that's your uh, re revenue increase, so but it depends on the strategy and so on. So if you think yeah, about okay. a pharmaceutical yeah. company, they've got a variety of these sales teams that goes out and try and market the drug. So if they buy a specific right. drug and they get the sales team as well, then obviously that's going to increase everything up in lockstep. But as your revenue goes up, your HTML. Your the better way to do it as well is to do it per segment, but that's if they use Then financing costs, and this is the one that's more important. Because the SNA is not that tricky, you can also work out the same thing. Works, what's fixed and what's variable. On the financing, it is extremely important to be gross and net. This is how much debt you have, and this is how much cash you have. Because obviously, the liquidity you get, either prime or um, a much higher extent versus if you make investments in a bank account or so your normal bank account that's got um, uh, the interest that you're going to get in there is going to be that difference still there but not you can work out in it but the main thing is you have to work out okay this is the interest income that you're getting from the cash component maybe not interest expense you have for the stuff that you have in life. Okay, and it's important to split those two because then you get a very accurate method. Okay, so once again, those steps. They've got 12 and 14. What they've done here, they've given me the average because they assume that during the gradually. Same thing with your investments. So what they say is, okay, your net expense or net interest expense is obviously gross uh, debt interest expense minus the gross interest income. The main thing is that one million expense that's on your income statement and you divided that by your average debt because as I said over the period you've increased it. So your interest rate here on your gross um your gross debt was seven a long time isn't it? What if I okay. here your your net interest expense was eight my last right, because you've taken 15 minus 5. Now we're 10 percent. So that's interesting. And what you earn was 4 percent. 200,000 divided by 5. So this is the risk always going to be. What is the risk of it? That net interest can actually be quite volatile. The longer after you have, the more you're going to demand. So I would say always go for. Of your gross. And remember, you're working out the average because the debt increased gradually over time. You didn't uh, go at the start of it. Okay. You guys must have one Then, interest income tax expense. Remember, there's three types well, uh, of income tax expenses. You have your income statement, the tax man. The fixed tax rate, and this is stuff that people use on their on their books. South Africa, the statutory tax rate is. Uh, okay, so the fixed tax rate, essentially, what it is is the. In, um, the income tax expense on your income statement divided by your profit before tax. Very important, that's your effective tax rate. The identity in a certain while, depending on what type of uh, company. But if it's a nice, easy company to model, it's always like 27.2 or 25.5 because they get a few deductions with regards to learnerships and all these other things. That's fine. You can model that going forward, and that's not too difficult. If it's one that's very, becomes very tricky to model. Okay, that's the first one. Your income, your cash status, and that's your income tax. 
So you just go to your, <laughs> the money that you save to you. So you go to your cash flow statement, you don't go to your income statement, and you get that number from Do what I say. It's like this, your income statement number, your tax, and then you get your cash flow. <laughs> this is the real one that you need to be aware of. Okay. And if this, that's maybe one way to... Number, don't you? What, you know, what, what if in your question there's no maturity premium, for example? this number and you compare it to that and it's big, big. Okay. Now, we are starting with. So that, but obviously you have to take into account the food taxes as well, but, but, but that's something to, uh, to, to that's it, oh, that's Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, this is the actual do you think cash paid and deferred taxes. Have you guys done the ability deferred tax assets or accounting pre tax income is less than your, uh, your, uh, your, this is that, that one. Yeah, right. So if, you, if your accounting pre tax income is less than your taxable income, then you've got a deferred tax asset, and vice versa. If your um, accounting pre tax income is more than your taxable income, <laughs> and the whole thing around that is because in future years, <laughs> you're going to have to catch it. So that's for temporary difference. If it's a permanent difference, it's going to be a permanent difference, you can't do anything. Have a look. Okay, you need to take that into account in your analysis. And then, on the, the balance sheet stuff, so retained earnings, retained earnings is quite easy. You take retained earnings, you add your, it also depends on what type of uh, company it is, but you take your retained earnings from the balance sheet uh, of, the, of the beginning of the year, you add your net income, and you deduct your Dividend spike, and then that's your returning for the net image. That's just a function of that. And that is the And obviously that'll be a But on your inventory, your inventory, what you're going to use, you're going to use the cost of goods sold that you've just forecasted divided by inventory turnover ratio. And that can be used to so, maybe to put it in a different way, you, let's say you've got, and remember you have to use cost of goods sales, you can't use sales. Sales is for your debtors, and uh, the debtors cost of goods sales is for your that You've got this, this cup. Just you sell this cup 12 times a year. Okay? So your inventory turnover, uh, your turnover days is 30, 30 days. So every 30 days you replenish this cup. Okay, well, so that's quite nice. That's quite a good turnover. Okay, so this. <laughs> as your sales increases, but your. Your inventory needs to go up to compensate you for that size. And also you're using cost of size, you're not using it. You're not, you haven't <laughs> inventory will go up if your sales goes up. Come to Super Bowl, very similar situation. Sales down, sales, 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 sales
about the answer if you're not particularly difficult, and you're going to do the same thing when it comes to creators. Exactly the same. Thing. These things are extremely important because the way I model the stuff is I've actually got a whole thing worked out on per half, and it's it just populates it by itself, but it uses a specific. I have to put in the days, like how many days for the inventory, how many days for the data, how many days for the creators. And if you worked out the history and you can see the days are for, for inventory days, it's anything between uh, 35 and 37, then you can, I mean, it's, you're not going to put in 20 days. I mean, the, the company doesn't work like that. That's, the cycle doesn't work like that. But it's quite nice because then you can put that stuff in and it automatically works out the cash flow that the company acquires. So it's, it, 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 it's once you have these things, the model is extremely easy. Okay. PPE, not too tricky. I mean, you've got your appreciation that you've worked out, and you've got your capital allocation when you with, with regards to your estate. Uh, um, the important thing around that is that it's not usual. PPE is this all you can just do it based on details and the mental for detailed information. It's not that tricky to do a proper cash flow budget. But once again, you can get a lot of that information just from the cash flow for investing activities on the cash flow for the past. All right. How do we do this? We can you can forecast that, and from that you can work out what the maintenance capex are and what the If you're looking at something like a clicks, clicks are going to expect clicks on the stores are going to maintenance. The analysis on assumptions, what type of assumptions, so if you change your discount rate, if you change your whatever, like what happens with your or GP mod, all this type of stuff. So you can actually use data tables when you work. You have to know what data tables are. Like, like go, go watch a YouTube video, how to do a data table on Excel. I promise you, it's the most awesome thing you can ever do. Really. It's super easy and it looks quite professional. Okay. Roik's return on invested capital, one of the most important metrics you'll ever get because it's very difficult to this type of thing or to, uh, to, to fudge these numbers. Net operating profit or loss, the net operating profit after tax, divided by invested capital. How is invested capital? Operating assets, less operating assets. I think that's mine and they've got this very nice wine farm that the execs go to. That is not an operating asset. You take that out. Okay, you can add that separately at the end. In the evaluation, it takes this cash, takes this cash, and let's not get too technical to this. Okay, so return on invested capital is, your return on invested capital tends to be within a range. Then if it starts to go up massively, that is a perfect company. Like that. Or massive moats. So that is how you add value to shareholders. Because if you're ROIC, your return on invested capital is above your WAC. Weighted average cost of capital. This is a very <laughs> important thing I'm saying this year. If your return on invested capital is above your weighted average cost of capital, you are adding shareholder value over the long term. And it's, it's not that it's clear to ROE because ROE can be manipulated a little bit. You can also say that Roik actually incorporates your, uh, your data um, Yeah, definitely. And then Roisy is a like Roik, the only difference is you you don't use the after tax, you use the before tax. The nice thing about Roik is you're comparing 
uh, companies, regardless of their capital structure, whereas with Rose Series, you're comparing companies regardless of their tax jurisdiction. So that's why it's nice to use Rose if you're comparing companies across jurisdictions. Okay. Now, with once again, if you look at investments, you do return on investment capital. It's like a really good thing. Okay. Okay, let's go now. Focus. How to focus industry and company sales, cost when first subject to price inflation or deflation. Okay, so I mean, I think the main thing here is that, uh, hmm. I mean, the main thing is that you have to just take into account, like, what's the, what's going to happen in the price of the product. Is, is the product something that helps? How elastic is the, is the, what's the price? If you've got SAP, if you've got SAP in your business, SAP puts in a 5% increase or a 10% increase for your licensing fee. You're not going to stop using SAP. I mean, that's why obviously you negotiated probably like a 20 year lease on the or contract. Okay, so. Or it's got a big moat, then the price elasticity is of such a nature that the guys that are supply can push through a bit higher prices than normal. If it's something different, the switching cost is low, there's not a lot of moat, then guys can just, especially when it comes to commodities, guys can just switch, switch between these commodities. Okay, and there's stuff that you need to take into account, geographic location, taxation, government, etc., etc. The reason why they say weather is, uh, this, let me give an example, uh, if, if it's extremely hot, I don't know if you guys know, there's actually weather derivatives that you can trade. Enron did it, and that's to do with natural gas. So, natural gas futures tend to peak when... ...natural gas prices will be much lower because... And that is the reason why, why weather might be very important for your specific company. There's a company called Montclair. I don't know if you guys know that company, it's a luxury company that makes down jackets and a few other like a company. Um, if it's not extremely cold, they're not selling extremely expensive down jackets in, in Europe. That's essentially the point. So depending and it's also the same as winning the sun. So agriculture is a perfect example of weather. So what happens with the wheat prices, wheat prices, corn prices, all that stuff impacts tiger brands, which impacts the bread prices, etc. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, he's just right. <laughs> yeah. So that's true with the with the rain. So necessity we should set that. And then how does technology affect your firm? So can it disrupt, can it bring down the cost of you producing the So the main thing is if you can, and you should try and forecast as long as you can, but obviously the, the longer you forecast, the lower predictive power your model will have. But the more important thing around this is that if you are forecasting for a highly cyclical company, you want to, you need just control this. So let's say this is the, you know, that's business cycle. Okay, so as the analyst, you kind of want to, you kind of want to not predict that it might be in my get forecast at the peak and then extrapolate it from there. That's going to be the wrong thing to do. Okay, so you have to see where you're on the cycle and you want to make sure that you you get it correct and you extrapolate it from there. And that's why it's important when it comes to um, your forecast period to say, okay, where are you in the cycle? What's going to happen to supply and demand? What's, what's the reason for this either being oversupplied or undersupplied? In the city, it's extremely important in the today because you want to normalize it. And, okay. and I always talk about two of the sites. How would you get it? Okay. 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 The main thing around this, if you if you have got a very short uh, time horizon that you're estimating for that, you're forecasting for, 
um, if you're going to put an external value after year one or after year two, then obviously what you're doing is you're estimating that things are going to continue growing into perpetuity at that growth rate. So that's why you probably want to use a multi stage model of some sort, depending on where the company is in its, in its, uh, in its cycle and its growth life cycle. That's what in its life cycle. So, from that perspective, obviously, it's important that you're not just short term, and then you kind of want to use a bit of a lot of even in this mature phase if you can do it. Okay. Uh, we look at general growth, growth rate pays a major role, blah, blah, blah. He takes the point of those reasons why the future growth economy will not be the same as the past. And these are the inflection points. Technology changes, economic environment, government decisions, and the state policies. So obviously it's not that easy to estimate what the technology change is going to be five years from now. But uh, sometimes you can see some of these things coming, especially when it comes to government, government regulation. If you think about the telco space, 5G, all these type of things is actually, you can build these things in your model, if, especially when it comes to capex and additional revenue from, from data, even though the price and the is dropping quite a bit. Okay. And then demonstrate the development of sales based performer company model. Okay, so following step must be kept up with from a model. First of all, we're going to do it from a GDP growth or market share growth. And you kind of gone through that already. You're going to estimate your cost of goods sold based on historic uh, percentages and the values and how that, that's gone through. When I say historic value, you just going to cost of goods sold divided by your sales and that's going to be your percentage. And you see how that has, hopefully that's been quite constant over the past five years and that's the type of percentage you're going to use. You're going to put your HTNA based on its fixed and its variable components. You're going to estimate your property cost as we've done already. The tax expense. Estimate the cash tax pay that's going to go into your cash flow statement, which is quite important. Model your balance sheet, which will work in capital and your uh, PP &E. and then lastly model your cash flow statement, which is not that easy. But uh, if you guys ever do it, give me a call because I'll uh, I'll tell you where, how to, how to, uh, how to do that. Okay, any questions? Okay, thanks everyone. I'll see you on Thursday. And if you have any questions, please uh, just ask before you leave. Uh, either two and a half or three. I'm going to try and do three. I'm going to do, so I'm going to... Um, it's going to be, I mean, how many, how many chapters do you have?